part one. So this Sunday, we are in part two. We are studying more of the radiographic diagnosis of cardiac diseases. Uh, now, what are the indications of thoracic radiography? See, when a pet, dog, or a cat comes to your clinic, what happens is uh, you examine the pet from far, you observe it from far, and then you examine it on the table, right? So uh, you will you will think of radiography when you see certain symptoms. Say there's you feel there's an evidence of cardiac disease, or there is certain the the pet is showing some respiratory problem, or there's a history of chronic cough. There are either abnormalities of the thoracic wall or either you're planning to give anesthesia or there is some sort of a swallowing disorder or something to do with the chest. So that is what you're going to decide when you first see a pet, when you suspect that there's some problem with the thoracic cavity, either with the respirations or with the heart. So what is the goal? The goal in diagnostic radiology is to obtain a maximum diagnostic information. So your radiograph should be such that you should be able to read as much as you can, but very important, with minimal radiation exposure to the patient, the person holding the pet, or the radiology personnel, and the general public. We know that radiation, radiology is good for diagnosis, but we have to be very careful when using radiations, especially when humans and pets are being exposed to these x-rays. So be careful. So what are the importance of these chest radiographs? Now you can, now you'll find that compared to other diseases, when pets have cardiopulmonary diseases, they show actually very few signs. And many a times they come to your clinic or your hospital in the last stage. If you look at working dogs, security dogs, police dogs, airport dogs, sniffer dogs, you'll find whenever they have cardiopulmonary problems, their performance gets compromised. They are not able to put in their best. So this is the importance of chest radiographs in cardiopulmonary diseases. So what would you normally see? What would you normally expect to see in a dog with cardiopulmonary diseases? Maybe the dog has a chronic cough. The pet parent tells you my dog has been coughing for a long, long time. Or maybe he has a breathing problem or few short walks and the dog starts panting. Excise intolerance is there. So these are the signs which will tell you that you no, need to look deeper into the chest. In some dogs, you might, feel, you might see the head and the neck extended or in, or in you know, cases which have been prolonged for a long time, you might see abdominal distension. In some dogs, you know, because of uh, chest pain, you might even see elbows abducted. You might see elbows abducted or an abdominal distension. So these are the few of the things which immediately will uh, divert your attention that I need to do something in case of cardiopulmonary diseases. I need to look into it. So how are you going to diagnose it? First is complete history, a thorough physical examination. You go in for radiographs and you, then you go in for laboratory studies. So history and physical examination are extremely, extremely important to diagnose cardiopulmonary problems. See, you must always consider your clinical examination or a physical examination as a diagnostic test. If we carry out very, very carefully, what happens is it's very sensitive and it will give us a clue of which direction we go next. For example, if, if you feel there are cardiac murmurs, Next step you can go is for echocardiography. If you suspect, oh, the symptoms are of congestive heart failure, then a physical examination and a chest X-ray is going to be extremely useful in such pets. Physical examination. See, cardiac auscultation is very important. You should allow a doctor to settle down into your clinic, allow it to rest for some time, see that a dog is calm and quiet, and then you start auscultating its heart. It will tell you about the heart rate, the heart rhythm, presence or absence of any abnormal sounds. So it's going to give you a lot of information with a simple auscultation. 
Suppose you suspect arrhythmia, then you go in for an ECG. Now, I said echocardiography is also very good tool for diagnosing of cardiac diseases, but it is best only in the hands of an experienced and a skilled operator. Echocardiography needs a lot of practice, a lot of years of experience to diagnose correctly. If you are lucky enough to have a Doppler echocardiography, it will give you a precise characterization of what are the hemodynamic disturbances that occur in the heart. So after your clinical examination, it will give you a clue of which way, which side you need to go, whether you need to do an ECG immediately or an echocardiography or a Doppler echocardiography. See, if a cardiac disease is present or suspected, it is always necessary to establish if the animal, if the pet has a sign of heart failure or whether the body has compensated in such a manner that though the pet has a disease, it's not showing it. Sometimes, you know, you can do laboratory tests like blood tests like troponin 1 levels. They are becoming increasingly available. These sort of tests will also help you to make a diagnosis of how severe the heart disease is. Because most important in cardiopulmonary diseases, the treatment will depend upon the stage of heart disease. Treatment will vary from stage to stage. So you've got to be very careful whether the dog or the pet has heart disease or whether it has a compensating mechanism which is there. So you confirm it step by step. Now look at the heart, you know, look at the basic. We all know, you know, the heart is a hollow muscular organ consisting of four chambers, the left atrium, the ventricle. The one way valve. So we also know that the oxygen depleted venous blood enters the right atrium and then it moves. The, uh, the oxygen rich blood enters into the left atrium and then it moves forward. So basically, as doctors, we are very familiar with the physiology of the heart. But as a clinician, we need to find out which part of the heart is not working or is weak and the other parts are compensating for it and how we are going to diagnose this. We know heart disease are of two types, acquired and congenital. If it's an acquired disease, history, physical examination, ECG, radiography, echocardiography, all these will help. If you have seen a congenital heart disease in a pup or on a newborn, then only physical examination or only radiography will not work. You might have to do advanced procedures such as cardiac catheterization, angiography, say especially in say PDA, patent ductus arteriosus. So radiology, today's, today's talk, we will restrict to acquired diseases where radiology works, where ECG works, okay, where clinical examination works. So when do you start? When, when is the radiography of the cardiovascular system indicated? When do you feel it is important that we need to take an X-ray now? When we suspect that this dog has a cardiac diseases and we need to stage of what level this cardiac disease is. Or we need to decide about the cardiac therapy. A radiograph is definitely going to be helpful. Or it may so happen that you've already started on cardiac therapy. But we need to monitor the response. Even then a radiograph is useful. Or how the cardiac disease is progressing with time. So radiographs at various stages is going to tell you the story of the heart. So if you look at normal radiographic anatomy last in my last lecture, last Sunday, I had told you this is a repeat. So if this is a, a, a lateral radiograph of the chest, you're seeing the trachea, you're seeing the posterior aorta, these, this is the diaphragm, this is the caudal vena cava, this is the heart, these are the borders of the heart, this is the lung lobe, the apical lobe, this is the diaphragmatic lobe, right. I would suggest that each one of you as a clinician see a number of normal x-rays radiographs. Once you scan 100, 200, 000 normal radiographs, 
then your eyes will get trained to pick up abnormal radiographs so that you become very familiar with the anatomy radiological anatomy so where 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 is the where is the thoracic vertebrae how do the ribs look how does the heart normal heart looks how does the anterior border how does the posterior border look how does the caudal vena cava look in the radiograph how do the diaphragm appear in the radiograph okay how does the trachea appear so once you see a number of normal x rays what you will do is your eyes will be able to pick up abnormality quickly and your chances of missing the abnormality is very less so whenever you get a chance to see a radiograph have a look at it discuss each and every part look at every part though it may appear normal similarly in the other view you have lateral view ventrodorsal view because normally two views are required i'll come into the later slides why you require two views is look at the heart how it looks in other view how 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 we are able to see the aortic arch the left auricle the left ventricle the right ventricle how does the lung appear what is the extent of the heart how does the diaphragm appear a dome shaped how is how does air appear how does air appear in the lung so once you see once you see this normal radiograph once you see this normal radiograph looking at a pathological radiograph becomes easier so you need to revise and re-revise the smaller and smaller structures in the chest say how does a descending aorta look like how does the heart look like from dorsal ventral view how does the right caudal artery look like how is the dome of the diaphragm look like how does the crura of the diaphragm look so you need to look at the radiograph several times then the positioning the positioning is very because see, ultimately in radiology what you are going to see is an image that image will depend upon how you have positioned the patient between the x-ray tube and the cassette so only if you are having a good radiograph you will be able to interpret it so interpretation of radiograph the primary thing is that the position has to be correct for a good quality radiograph now radiographs are it's a compression of a three dimensional image into two into a two dimensional structure into a two dimensional film so you need to always take radiographs at two angles okay as far as the chest is concerned you can have to take a lateral view and a dorsal uh, dorsal ventral or a ventrodorsal view so two radiographs at right angles to each other are going to help you a lot in making a correct diagnosis in case you take only one radiograph there is a possibility that you miss you might miss out a very very important lesion now in case of if if you are taking a lateral view the x ray beam has to be positioned the x ray beam has to be positioned towards the fifth intercostal space if you are taking a dorsal ventral view then it should be then the beam has to be centered between the caudal border of the scapula because you need to have a perfect picture of the heart ventro dorsal projection you know is 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 a dog put is put on the back i would rather avoid because you know because the loose sternum uh, pericardic ligament and secondly a dog which comes to you a pet which comes to you with cardiac problem breathing problem finds difficult to breathe once you put it on its back so a dorsal ventral view if possible take also remember that you know when you are taking chest radiographs the dog is continuously breathing inspiration and expiration is there so you shoot a radiograph at that point when the dog has inspired air so that you get a negative contrast into the chest and you get a good picture now we know whenever we are taking radiographs of moving organs like lung heart we need to keep a very short exposure time say 1 by 60th or 1 by 120th of a second the milliampere product range should be between 3 and 10 milliamperes see all these i am telling you because all this is going to affect the quality of radiograph because you are taking a radiograph of a part which is continuously moving if you get multiple images it will not be possible for you to read the radiograph most important is also what you do is the kv setting keep adequate so that you get a very good scale you get a very good gray scale and most important is most important is to use a grid grid will prevent scattered x rays so what will happen is you get a very good quality image 
So use of grid, I would recommend when you're taking x-rays of the chest in dogs. Now what we do is we take two radiographs at right angles to each other. Now this is now this the one on the left is the lateral view. This is the other view, dorsal mental view. Because you need to see the organs which you're looking for from both the sides. Now, now in our study today, we're going to look at the heart. So we need to look at the heart from both the angles. Now remember the terminology. If the patient is lying down on the right side, that means the right side of this body is touching the x-ray plate, it is called as a right lateral radiograph. If his left side is on the plate, it is called as a left lateral radiograph. So you should also know which radiograph you have taken, whether it is a light, light uh, lateral or the left lateral, because that is going to affect the image. What you're going to see will depend on whether it was a right lateral radiograph or the left lateral radiograph. Most important is, when you're taking the radiograph of the chest for the heart, please see that the entire thoracic cavity is included. Let the last rib also come. And most important is, when you're taking a radiograph of a dog on the, on the lateral side, the dog is lying down on the table, gently pull the leg forward because otherwise the elbow of the dog will come very close to the heart. And the apical lobe of the lung, you will not be able to see. So when you are positioning the dog, see the front legs are gently pulled forward so that you get a very clear view of the chest without being obstructed either by the scapula or the humerus or the elbow joint. So the entire chest needs to be included. Only then can you read the radiograph properly. Now let us go into some technical details about veterinary radiology. What type of machine you are going to use? Because every clinic has got a radiograph. So whether you're using a thick, uh, 30 or 60 MA uh, machine for the limbs or whether you're using a machine which is higher MA, say 500 MA machine. Because what happens is the type of machine you use will also affect the quality of radiograph. Because you may be having a small Chihuahua or a small Shih Tzu to be x-rayed or even a huge Great Dane to be x-rayed. So depending on the patients, depending on the type of dogs you see, you will have to use a machine which will give you good quality x-rays. Now x-rays, you know, are between black and white. That is, there are a lot of gray shades. Say, for example, in a bone will look absolutely white in the radiograph because it will absorb all the x-rays. While air will not absorb a single x-ray. So on the radiograph, air will appear black. And in between all these soft tissues, there'll be different shades of gray. So if you're getting a number of shades of gray in the radiograph, that means it is a good radiograph. You have used the right machine. You have used the right kilo voltage and milliampere seconds. Okay. Now on the X-ray, as I said, on the radiographic film, you have different densities. Air will absolutely appear black and heavy metals or a coin or any uh, metallic sheet will appear absolutely white. Even a bone will appear white because it will absorb all the X-ray. You have a lot of variations of gray which you need to look for in the radiograph. Now, is radiograph the only tool by which you can diagnose cardiac and respiratory problems? No, I would not. I would not say yes, but I would say rather be careful. Ah, you know, because as far as cardiovascular problems are concerned, there is a wide range of cardiac appearance in dogs. If you look at a Labrador's heart, a normal Labrador's heart, 
and a normal pug's heart. I will show you those radiographs. They look different, though both are normal. Number two, the effect of positioning also has a very important role on how you see the heart, especially the borders of the heart. And most important fact is that many physiological changes are not accompanied by morphological changes. That means there may be changes taking in the heart, in the dog's body, but these changes will not be reflected in the radiograph, not necessarily be reflected in the radiograph. So radiograph per se, you can use it for diagnosis. But as I said, don't depend only on radiographs. You have to depend on your clinical examination, laboratory examination, ECG, echocardiography, all these things together, and then conclude and then come to a diagnosis. Now, body habitus. See the radiograph. See, for example, if you see the radiograph of a uh, see the radiograph of a lab, the, radi the heart, the heart of a lab, a normal lab, is totally different than a heart of a pug. That means what dog you're seeing, what breed of dog you're seeing will also matter, will also matter when you're looking at radiographs. In cats, now as far as cats are concerned, if you see not much variation is there as far as the uh, heart radiographs are concerned. But however, in case of obese cats, in fat cats, there will be a lot of fat deposition around the heart. And so definitely the cardiac cellet will, you know, will have a different, you see the outline of the, you see the outline of the uh, heart, it will be different in uh, obese cats as compared to lean cats. So though in cats there is not very much variation as compared to dogs, but there will be definitely a lot of variation between a lean cat and an obese cat. Now, as I said, radiographic positioning can have a very profound effect, whether it's a ventrodorsal view or a dorsoventral view. Now, if you can see in the uh, dorsoventral view, the diaphragm is, you know, it comes cranially. If you see the dorsoventral view, this diaphragm has come much more cranially as compared to a ventrodorsal view. So, before you take a radiograph and after, and at the time you're seeing a radiograph, you should be aware of how the radiograph was taken in what position it was taken, and only then going for its interpretation. Also, whether the dog was kept on the right side of the chest, the, the right the right side was kept near the plate, or the left side, that is called as, was it a left lateral radiograph or the right lateral radiograph? Now you will see the, you will see the difference in the shape of the heart. Okay, both in the A radiograph as well as B radiograph. You can see, you know, in one in one of the radiographs, the heart is elevated as compared to the light, right rattle. So what happens is whether it's the left lateral or the light rattle, the image is going to change even in the same dog. So before you do an interpretation, because these two hearts of the same dog appear different, you see the outline appears different because one is left lateral, one is right lateral. OK, so you need to be very careful. Again, I'm telling you before you see the radiograph, be very careful of what position the radiograph has been taken. Now the cardiac cellet, that is the outline of the cardiac border, is not only made up of say pericardium. It's not only the heart. You will have the pericardium, you will have the pericardial fluid, you will have the pericardial space or any fluid in the mediastinum, which is very close to the heart and which blends with the heart will give you the shadow like a heart. So now see in this radiograph, what you can see is you can see the heart. You can see the heart. At the same time, you can see fat around the heart. So you should be able to differentiate between the actual heart and the other organs which are close to the heart, but contribute to the heart's image because of summation effect. Very, very important is when you're looking at cardiac patients who are obese, they may be having a lot of fat around the heart, especially in the mediastinal space, which increases the size of the heart. So when you're looking at obese patients and especially finding out the size of the heart, you need to be very careful because you need to put at the back of your mind that this is an obese patient 
and he may be having a lot of fat in the mediastinal space. But is there a quantitative method of cardiac measurement? Yes, there is. There is, which is called as a vertebral heart scale or a vertebral heart score. Now, pay attention. This this is very important because this will rule out the, the uh, other shortcomings like breed to breed variation or age to age variation. So, in this VHS method, what is done is the length of the long axis and the short axis of the heart is measured. So, you measure the long axis of the heart and the short axis of the heart is measured. Now, this is compared to the thoracic vertebrae starting from T4, anterior border of T4. Okay. And it's measured as either four vertebrae or four and a half vertebrae or five vertebrae and a five and a half vertebrae according to its length. Both are added and then the total is calculated. I'll show you how it is done. So to quantify heart size in terms of vertebral number, see the normal VHS, the normal would be about 9.7 vertebrae plus minus 0.5. Now look at the way it is done. So most important is when you're calculating VHS score, see that the entire thorax has come into the radiograph. Starting from say T4 to T12 must be clearly, clearly visible in the radiograph. Now you take a caliper a measuring scale and measure the longest axis of the cardiac cellet from the carina to the mainstream bronchus to the apex of the heart. So this is what you measure very, very clearly with the help of a caliper. Now this caliper, this caliper you place on the thoracic vertebrae starting at the anterior border of T4 and measure the length in terms of the vertebrae. You measure this length in terms of this vertebrae. Designate that as L. So this long axis Whatever you have measured is L. Now, using caliper, now measure the short axis of the heart. Short axis. Now, this remember short axis of the heart when you're measuring, you have to measure in the most widest part of the heart. Most widest part of the heart. And number two, this measurement has to be exactly at right angles to this. So it has to be at the widest part. It has to be at right angles to the long axis, measure it with the caliper and place this caliper again on the thoracic vertebrae starting on the anterior border of the T4, anterior border of T4. Okay, anterior border of T4. Measure this length. This you designate as S. This you designate as S. Okay, this length is S. Now, next, what you do is You have to do the sum of two measurement. Now our long axis length was 5.2. While the short axis, if you see, while the short axis, if you see, is about 4.4. While the short axis is about 4.4. So you add these two, long axis and short axis. So 5.2 plus 4.4 is 9.6. So this 9.6, that means this is a normal heart score. This is a normal the heart is in normal range. You'll require a lot of practice. You'll require a good radiograph. You'll require calipers, a simple measuring scale to measure this. You do a number of you do a number of radiographs on it, and then you'll realize that it's, it's it's not very difficult. Only thing you need to be very precise of where you take the long axis, where you take the short axis, and that will give you the vertebral heart scale or the vertebral heart score. So the best use of VHS. Now, what when it can be done is you compare the cardiac sizes on a serial radiograph. So you have a patient who has come with heart problems. So today you have taken one X-ray. After four months you have taken. After again one year you have taken. So you will be able to monitor. You'll be able to monitor the follow-up of the patient. So if you take these, so this is the best way of using VHS on a single patient. If you have taken serial radiographs, say after a few months or a year or something, to monitor your therapy and to monitor. How the patient is doing. Also, there is subjective radiographic assessment is also there. Now, this subjective, like the heart has become big, the atrium has become big, the ventricle has become big. Now, this will depend upon, will also depend upon 
how how pronounced these abnormalities are it's it's a, it's a it's a tool you know for assessing cardiac abnormalities even subjective parameters are there even for evaluating pulmonary circulation so and it's also helpful in evaluating the response to the therapy you're giving but remember any suspected cardiac abnormalities you must interpret based on history and based on signs shows by the patient don't just go on radiographic view radiograph is an image it will tell you only a part of the story but clinical symptom shown by the patient your clinical examination findings the physical findings the history all this put together and then make a diagnosis of a disease related to the heart and the lung to make heart simple in dorsomental view you know the heart has been uh, divided or described in the clock phase analogy like you have 12 o'clock 6 o'clock 3 o'clock 9 o'clock so when you take a dorsomental view or a ventral dorsal view there are various structures which are visible in the radiograph how do you know what structure is where for example this is the left auricle which you are seeing okay then the aortic arch you see or the right atrium you are seeing so these are structures which you are seeing and a clock phase analogy is like say between between 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock this is between say at 12 o'clock or this is at bit at uh, One o'clock, and this is say between two o'clock and three o'clock. So this clock phase analogy, uh, uh, this thing analogy, is used to describe the different lesions we see in the heart, especially in dorsomental view when you are seeing multiple, multiple uh, blood vessels or multiple uh, pulmonary structures or multiple vascular structures overlapping each other. Now let us look at one by one. let us take one chamber at a time say the left atrium so when there is enlargement of the left atrium of the heart what are you going to see see this is the most frequently encountered cardiac enlargement in dogs that is because of the diseases of the middle wall are more prominent are more common so the left atrial enlargement you are going to see very common in dogs which have middle wall diseases so there is as you can see here there is a dilate there is a dilation here you see in the radiograph there is a dilation here this is this is usually because of mitral valve diseases or maybe because over circulation over circulation causing by volume overload this is a volume overload also you will get this left atrial enlargement you can see here that this uh, if you can see this is the this is the trachea okay this this is the heart starts from here this is the left atrium and here you can see there's loss of waste so this is the area where you look into where actually when you're looking at the left atrial enlargement in the lateral view in the lateral view dilation of the left left atrium in the dogs it will cause it will be in the posterior part now see how huge this is how huge enlargement this is of the left atrium there is loss there is no waste at all there is loss there is loss of caudal waste which we see in the posterior border of the heart most important is see where the trachea is pushed because this because this is enlarged because this is enlarged what has happened is this is pushed the trachea towards the uh, towards the vertebrae so you will see the entire trachea is pushed dorsally is pushed upwards because this has occupied a lot of space normally such dogs will have a very typical cough you'll find a very typical cough in the left in dogs with left atrial enlargement now let us go to the left ventricle left left ventricle 
it can enlarge because of hypertrophy or because of dilation and what happens is the entire thoracic because this this is a big chamber the entire trachea which is there dorsally gets pushed upwards so what happens is the trachea actually makes an angle with the vertebrae so when the trachea gets pushed upwards you will see that the angle between the trachea and the vertebrae reduces this you will see when there is uh, enlargement of the enlargement of the left ventricle when there is enlargement of this left ventricle this can happen because of preload chronically increased preload there's a lot of load on this chamber so it enlarges and what happens is when the left ventricle enlarges in the radiograph when the left ventricle enlarges it appears as though the whole heart is enlarged it appears as if the whole heart is enlarged and the trachea is pushed forward because it's a huge chamber it's a big chamber and when it enlarges it contributes to the overall increase in size of the heart now look at the right atrium actually it's not very common so radiographic detection of an enlarged right atrium is not very commonly seen uh, you know except in say if it has got some tricuspid valve problems this is usually caused by dilation the 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 chamber is dilated and if you see in the in the view in the dorsoventral view or the vd view you will find see between 9 o'clock position and 11 o'clock position there is a bulge so between 9 o'clock position and 11 o'clock position there is a huge bulge this is very typical of the right enlargement of the right atrium this is the enlargement of the right atrium as there is a bulge between 9 o'clock position and 11 o'clock position on the dorsoventral view so diagrammatically how it looks like see the trachea gets elevated the, the right atrium is enlarged so the trachea gets elevated now end view of the trachea you can actually you need to see only one bronchi but now because the trachea is elevated you see two bronchi you will also see that the the cranial caudal axis this axis increases because there is a bulge here so these are signs which you have to look for in the right atrial enlargement now let us look at the right ventricle the right the right ventricle of the heart can enlarge because either because of hypertrophy or dilation now you know the right ventricle uh, undergoes hypertrophy in response to an afterload in the process increase afterload or say when there is pulmonary hypertension now the right ventricle you must remember has a thin heart wall has a thin wall so what happens is any change in shape of the right ventricle will add to an enormous change in shape of the heart because of thin wall so when the when the wall is like this the shape of the heart is like this but when the hall when the wall gets thickened you will find it contributes the enlargement of the heart the shape and size of the heart so there's a there's a huge difference in the shape and size of the heart when the right ventricle this chamber of the heart gets enlarged the right ventricle normally is in contact with the sternum and what happens is when the right ventricle enlarges the sternal contract increase the the contact of the heart with the sternum increases now if you see in this ventral dorsal view that will you will see in the lateral view but i will show you that view also but if you see in the uh, but if you see in the dorsal ventral view what happens is it appears like an inverted d you can see here this border appears straight while this border appears round so there's an increase in cardiac mass on the right side which gives an appearance of an inverted d of an inverse d okay the straight border and this border now you see the same thing in the lateral view the contact of the heart the contact of the heart and the sternum has increased the cardiac apex has been displaced normally you know what happens is the cardiac contact with the sternum ranges between 2.5 to 3 intercostal spaces normally that is considered as normal but in anything in excess of 3 is an indication that there is a right ventricular enlargement
Now see this. This heart is contact right from here to this place. So it's definitely a right ventricular enlargement because the this border of the heart is in contact with the sternum for a long, long time. Now we spoke about individual chamber enlargement. What about the enlargement of the heart as a whole, the entire heart? Because this can happen when all the chambers get enlarged or can happen when the entire heart gets enlarged. Say, for example, in case of a dilated cardiomyopathy, it's a common cause of generalized cardiomegaly. So cardiomyopathy causes cardiomegaly. If you see, the cardiac cellet appears larger than expected. Now, this is normal. This is normal. If you see this heart size, it's appearing larger than normal. You see all chambers have become big. At the same time, the heart also is appearing bigger. So what so what you're going to see? This is a diaphragmatic, this is a diagrammatic representation. So what happens is the angle of the caudal one when I give also changes. The heart is occupying a larger space. The posterior border becomes straight, upright. The anterior border has become upright. And the angle between the thoracic spine or the thoracic vertebrae and the trachea has reduced because this heart, which is enlarged, has pushed the trachea up. When this trachea goes up, the angle between the vertebrae on top and the trachea reduces and this angle becomes smaller and smaller, acute and acute. So trachea gets displaced, gets pushed. So this is a radiograph of general cardiac enlargement. You can see the upright anterior border. You can see the height of the cardia. So much the heart is, so much is uh, more than two thirds the height of the thoracic cavity. So this is a sign of general cardiac enlargement. Whenever we suspect that there is a, a generalized cardiomegaly, I would suggest is don't just depend on the radiograph. Go in for echocardiography. E echocardiography is going to give you a more specific lesion. Is going to tell you more about the heart, is more about the chambers, everything. Now, the thoracic cavity also has a lot of blood vessels. So, when there are changes in the heart, because we are studying cardiovascular, so heart changes we know, but also when the heart changes, the blood vessels associated with the heart also change. For example, take the example of this caudal vena cava. Okay, caudal vena cava. Now it has got a diameter and its diameter can be compared. See, it can be judged to be enlarged only if it is consistently larger. Remember, larger in diameter than the length of the fifth or the sixth thoracic vertebrae, vertebral bodies of the spine. So you need to have a lateral view. You need to compare the diameter and compare it with fifth or sixth thoracic vertebra. So in case of blood vessels, in case of major arteries, in case of major veins, you need to have a good radiograph where you can see this. You should be able to measure the diameter and then compare it with the thoracic vertebrae. So that will give you a rough estimate of the whether the diameter or whether the blood vessels have increased in size or reduced in size. Also, there are other methods I'll show you like this. You can compare it with other blood vessels also. For some other measure, the caudal vena cava, this caudal vena cava can be compared with the ascending aorta, with the descending aorta, sorry, with the descending aorta. The caudal vena cava, you know, you, you diagnose it as it is become enlarged. When you compare it with, when you compare it with the descending aorta, it should be 1.5 times in diameter of the descending aorta. Only then you One thing, a radiograph which shows you caudal vena cava, a radiograph which shows you ascending and descending aorta, and then you compare the sizes of the two. Compare and find a ratio. Only then you can make out whether the blood vessels have increased in size as compared to each other. This is a radiograph. Now, this dog didn't have a lot, lot of amount of fat. So you are easy, able to see the caudal vena cava, you are able to see the pulmonary vein, you are able to see the posterior aorta. So if a dog is obese, these things become difficult because of 
becomes much, much easier. So this is the ventrodorsal view. As I said earlier, you should know where the where you're going to look for the various blood vessels in which lobe. You have the apical lobe, the cardiac lobe, the diaphragmatic lobes. The blood vessels are, are there in each lobe. So you need to find out the blood vessel and then compare its dimensions. Out, out has a very important blood vessel as far as the chest is concerned. Now, if there is enlargement of the aorta, both if you see in uh, dorsoventral and VD view, that indicate there's a dilation of the aortic arch. What you see, a focal bulge. What you see is a focal bulge anteriorly. In the pre-cardiac mediastinum, you see a focal bulge. Okay. In lateral view, what you see, if the aorta has enlarged this, it causes an increase, it creates a mass-like thing in the cranial aspect of the heart. Now, this is the heart. So this is creating a bulge here. So this indicates that this is the dilatation, this dilation of the aorta. The aorta has increased in size. Main pulmonary artery. Actually, main pulmonary artery is very difficult to make out in even a normal radiograph. It's very difficult because it's it's a very small artery. There's aorta on top, and there's heart below. So it's 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 it cannot be it cannot be significantly seen in a plain radiograph. But it will appear as a bulge in one o'clock position. Here it will appear as a bulge if you have taken a dorsoventral radiograph and it's really enlarged. Only then you will be able to only then you will be able to see the main pulmonary artery. So common causes would be say pulmonary hypertension or a patent ductus arteriosus. So all this will cause the main pulmonary artery will, will cause this main pulmonary artery to bulge. So this normally, if you take a plain radiograph, this pulmonary artery is not normally seen because it gets merged with these two. And very only if it is enlarged, only if it's pathological, you can make out. arterial and venous changes. See, if you're reading vascularity in the chest, otherwise it becomes incomplete without evaluating the main pulmonary artery, okay, as well as the peripheral pulmonary arteries and veins. So not only you need to see the heart, but also you need to see the main pulmonary arteries and veins. See, for example, in the lung pericamal vessels, the airways are arranged, you know, there's a definite pattern in which it's arranged, like artery, bronchus vein. So this is a definite pattern in which it is arranged. You need to see these radiographs in this pattern. And you know, let me tell you first as a young as as radiologist beginners, you need to concentrate on heart, the borders of the heart, the lung, and only after you see 100, 200, 300, 400 x-rays, 500 x-rays, then you will start on then you start concentrating on minor like blood vessels. First you start on aorta, vena cava, the angles. And slowly, slowly focus on to smaller things. Only then you'll be able to train your eye to pick up even changes which are there in pulmonary artery and veins. Now, you know, there are, there are, there are certain methods by which you are able to judge these uh, peripheral pulmonary arteries. They should be approximately the same size as their veins. So pulmonary arteries and veins should almost be of the same size. Now, Comparison is also made. Now, how this comparison is made? Its comparison is made with the ninth rib. See how it is made. Now, when these blood vessels cross the ninth rib, they produce a summation shadow. Okay. Because the rib, which is a bone, and the blood vessel, which is soft tissue, overlap each other. 
if the pulmonary artery is enlarged if the pulmonary artery is enlarged the summation of the shadow will be horizontal you see this because the pulmonary artery is enlarged this artery is enlarged so the long axis is bigger if the pulmonary artery is small then the summation shadow will be oriented in a vertical direction so these are small clues which will tell you even the summation radiographs will tell you that oh this is an enlarged artery this is a small artery okay you compare it with the ninth thoracic rib oh you know mitral valve diseases are very common in dogs it's the most common acquired disease if you see the mitral valve here it is it is it is it is it is one of the most common diseases which you see in especially in pets and radiographic signs can include in you know, the various left atrial enlargement enlargement of the left atrium left ventricular enlargement the ventricle also can get enlarged because the valve doesn't flow properly then you'll get pulmonary uh, venous uh, hypertension you'll get uh, and also you'll get various pulmonary edema within the chest you'll get edematous shadow you'll get fluid within the chest so these these mitral uh, insufficiencies is the most common acquired heart disease which you must look for especially if you're looking at older dogs smaller breeds okay cardiomyopathy very common in dogs it results from a weakened and a dysfunctional myocardial contractility so the muscles of the heart have become weak there is cardiomyopathy is there now the heart is dilated very common in dobon pinchners great danes cocker spaniels boxers i'm sure every clinician who is attending my seminar must be seeing these cases now most important is you know many a times you find that the dog is clinically you will find oh this dog i suspect to have cardiomyopathy but the radiograph is normal that can happen that can happen it's always possible that what you see, what you find clinically may not you always see in the radiograph is usually caused by volume overload or ventricular dilation so you have to be very careful about these these type of cases which you can diagnose rather easily with your clinical examination radiograph and all other methods which i have told you earlier pulmonary vein dilation from mitral valve dysfunction so so when you are looking at cardio uh, cardiomyopathy radiographs there are few things which will definitely stand which will definitely distinctly stand in the radiograph you see pleural effusions also sometimes you might see hepatomegaly ascites very typically seen in right sided heart failures very commonly you'll also see pulmonary edema in the radiograph and of course you will confirm with your clinical examination so these are some of the radiographs which you need to look at carefully and correlate with your clinical findings pericardial effusions now what what happens is if there are pericardial effusions they merge with the border of the heart and you find that the heart appears enlarged the heart appears like a globoid round structure both in lateral and vd view because there are certain effusions which are which are at the border of the heart pericardial effusions are there okay sometimes the heart appears so big that it touches the lateral border that it touches the lateral border of the chest you need thoracic wall it's touching see there's a huge heart and the most important is the margins appear very distinct and clear very distinct and clear you'll see even in this when there is pericardial effusion you see the margins are very clear now the other way around do you get size of the heart reduced yes you do very rarely but yes you do reduction in size of the heart is also seen because of the reduction in circulating vascular volume when there is reduction in circulating volume blood loss is there or very typically in edison's disease you will see that the heart shrinks and reduces in size here you can see a small heart so there are cases when you can see a large heart where you can see a, uh, you can see a reduced heart heart which is reduced in size a normal heart a heart which has 
some chambers enlarged, some chambers reduced. So this is what we study about heart. So I thank you all for your time on this Sunday evening. Thank you all for your attention. I thank Orihil Life Sciences, the Indian Veterinary Association and Pet Practitioners Association, National Capital Region for giving the, me this opportunity. Thank you so much.